historic presentation night for December 2021. It's our last one for the year. Mm -hmm. Running out of months, so it has to be. I'm Jeff Bush, your host for the evening. Uh, how many first timers do we have here tonight? Whoa, cool. How'd you all hear about it? I know how you heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> These guys on Facebook. These guys got Facebook. Email. It works. You get email. All right, cool. Uh, how many non-members do we have here tonight? Where's Becca? <laughs> Becca, are you taking names? You noted noting seat numbers? Okay, all right. Becca's our uh, membership person. If you have any mem uh, um, questions about membership, she's the one to ask. For the non-members, did you know that um, these events are free for members? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know you can buy an individual membership for $60? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, if you were to come to 10 of these next year, that'd be like putting $40 in your pocket. Is that cool? <laughs> now how many non-members do we have? <laughs> All right. For the members, we do ask, as we do every month, for donations. We've got donation box over here. we got another one in the hall. Uh, if each one of the members could drop a $5 bill on the way out, that would help us to continue to bring these programs to you. Um, currently, we have no revealed upcoming events, if you go to the website. <clears throat> <laughs> but until then, you can check the website, because probably around, uh, what, middle of February, we'll start to populate that? January. Or January, even better. <laughs> All right. So check our website, yankeeairmuseum.org. Uh, go to the events page, and uh, we'll start populating that. But until then, a little side note here. Our very own author and historian, Barry Levine, will be speaking at the Belleville Area District Library next Thursday. That's the 9th at 7 p.m. And he's going to talk about the history of the Yankee Air Museum. And it's free. So you can be a member. And it's free. You can be a non-member, it's free. It's not a bad deal. <laughs> so that's, that's a good program. Barry's a good speaker, and uh, we'll talk more about that later. At this time, we would like to ask that you turn all your cell phones to stun or off, <laughs> and hold all your questions until after the program. Our speaker tonight is co-founder of JetBlue Airways, a U of M business school professor, go blue, beat Iowa, <laughs> a former FA-18 pilot, Flight instructor for several years and chief flight instructor at the Navy Flight Weapons School, better known as Top Gun. Yeehaw, Jester's dead. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Dr. Mike Barger. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Can you guys hear me back in the back okay? I've never been accused of being a, a quiet person, so you ought to be able to hear me. Uh, going through my audience here, how many aviators do I have? Pilots? All right. Uh, supporters, mechanics, maintainers? Okay. Aspiring pilots? <laughs> Aspiring pilots? Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, I will do my best to uh, edutain you here for uh, an hour or so. And every once in a while we'll do that that's, just to wake you up. That's not working well. All right. I'll Good. Better? All right. That sounds better. All right. So uh, warming up here, let me take you through a little bit of, uh, of my story just for a moment so you know kind of how I got to uh, where I am today. So we've got this uh, imagery showing up on a couple of screens back there. Some of these might be a little bit tough to see, but we'll work through that. So I'm a local boy. I grew up in uh, Howell. Um, on uh, what used to be Big Crooked Lake, now is East Crooked Lake. Um, too many big crickets, apparently. Um, and uh, I started flying uh, out at uh, Livingston County Airport when I was seven years old. So uh, back in 1971 uh, is when I started to fly. Uh, my dad was a United Captain, former Army Air Corps flight instructor, spent the whole uh, World War II in Houston as a trainer. Uh, for those of you that fly, um, he was uh, in the war for two and a half years and got over 5,000 flight, uh, flight hours in two and a half years. So he was uh, in the airplane a lot. 
Um, he actually laid the asphalt, the first asphalt out of Lewis County Airport. So I kind of grew up around that airport. Uh, just a week before my eighth birthday, I soloed. So I soloed in that, a Piper Cherokee. Um, my mom didn't know about it. Dad, uh, Dad took me out and strapped me in the left seat and said, uh, you know, please come back. And so I did, a, did a trip around the pattern there. Uh, it was all, uh, all downhill from there. Um, while I'm talking about flying, uh, whether you're an aspiring pilot, an old pilot, or just semi-interested, I cannot more strongly encourage you to go and take a flight just for fun. You can get one just about anywhere uh, that has a, certainly you can get one anywhere that has a flight school. There are airports all over the place. It is not absurdly expensive and it is really, really cool. So if you're interested, please do that, okay? And if you're not interested in going to drive around yourself, come and take a ride with these guys. Uh, I was lucky enough to do, uh, to, to, to do a ride uh, and it was absolutely spectacular. It was one of the most enjoyable things I've done in the last 20 years. So please uh, find some time to go fly. There is nothing like it. So, all right, public service announcement complete. Um, grew up in Howell, went to Howell High School, ended up going to the University of Michigan uh, for my undergraduate degree, played some baseball there. Uh, Barry Larkin was my uh, year group. If you're a baseball fan, he went, uh, got drafted by Cincinnati, uh, played there his whole career, now is in the Hall of Fame, has been retired for lots of years, which means two things to me. One, I wasn't nearly as good a baseball player as he was, and two, I'm really old now, because uh, he's been uh, in the Hall of Fame for quite a while. But, uh, uh, but it was a ton of fun. While I was in school, uh, I gave flying lessons uh, down at Ann Arbor Airport. In fact, uh, the favorite part of my growing up flight instructor story is that, uh, so I soloed uh, at seven, I got my pilot's license at 14, because in 71 you could do that. I got my flight instructor uh, license when I was 15, which was before I could get a driver's license here in Michigan. So I had to have mommy drive me to the airport so that I could give flying lessons to people and then she had to come pick me up and drive me home. So I thought it was uh, um, Anyway, so that's how I put myself through uh, school. Uh, when I left uh, University of Michigan in 1986, um, I decided to, uh, to fly something fairly sporty. Uh, like I said, I grew up in an airline family, but the airlines weren't doing very well in the mid uh, 80s. Dad suggested I go fly something a little more, uh, a little more sporty than, uh, than a, a Boeing. Um, and so I went and flew these things for, uh, for 13 years. So in my 13 years in the Navy, I uh, flew for a couple of operational squadrons, VFA-15 and VFA-34. Um, I flew uh, uh, that uh, F-18 for F-18 uh, A models for a while, C models for a while. Those were the small ones. Uh, I flew a Lot 6 A model, which was the sixth version of the A's, and I flew the very last uh, uh, Lot 21, which was the last model of the C's, the small version of the Hornet. So I saw the full spectrum of the small F-18, which is just like the one you have out here, which I walk around, I walked around about 20 times today with a big old smile on my face. I couldn't keep my hands off it. It's just so pretty out there. So uh, about 2,000 hours in the Hornet, I got about 1,000 hours in the, uh, in the F-16N, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Um, did three six-month cruises, uh, two cruises on uh, CBN-71, the Eisenhower and one cruise, I'm sorry, the Roosevelt, and one cruise on CBN-69. The uh, Eisenhower, uh, 451 arrested landings, uh, almost the same number of night and day traps. Okay, so that's my uh, time on the boat. Uh, back in 1991, my first deployment was a Desert Storm, so 40-day war. I flew 40 missions in 40 days during Desert Storm. Rick Herter was the artist that drew this up after the war, which is kind of cool. Picked a BFA-15 Hornet, which was the squadron that I was with, and a Kuwaiti uh, A-4 there. Uh, after I finished my first uh, fleet squadron, uh, I uh, went through Top Gun as a student. One of the few things in the movie they actually got right is you go through as a student, you do really well, and they ask you to come back and teach. So I went through as a student in uh, late 92. They asked me to come back as an instructor, and from 93 to 96, uh, I flew Top Gun F-18s. Uh, we were out at Miramar at the time, uh, out in San Diego, and then uh, while I was there, we moved the whole squadron up to Fallon, Nevada, and I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a moment. Uh, that little airplane in the lower right-hand corner there is an F-16N. Um, for those of you that uh, kind of follow jet aviation, uh, the best thing about the F-16N is it had a really big motor and we gutted all of the kind of combat avionics out of it. So with a full internal tank of gas, it was about 1.3 to 1 thrust to weight. 
which meant that I could launch that airplane, point the nose straight up and accelerate vertically. And so when we would uh, fly out of Yuma, because we were based in San Diego, we'd go do some missions around Yuma, we'd land there, get some gas, and then I'd fly from Yuma over to San Diego, and we'd launch out of uh, Yuma, point our four ship of F-16s straight up, and we'd climb from sea level to 40,000 feet in less than a minute. This was kind of fun. Um, the controllers always had a lot of fun with us uh, launching out of there. Okay, um, my last uh, tour in the Navy, I left Top Gun in uh, 1996. I went back to the fleet, uh, helped uh, change over an A6 squadron to F-18Cs, and then did a deployment uh, over around uh, Bosnia and, uh, and uh, uh, um, Kosovo, and so we got to see some, some green ink uh, combat uh, ops over there as well. I left the Navy in uh, 1999 uh, and uh, joined my brother Dave and six other airline executives and started this company. You heard in the introduction, so we started JetBlue. Uh, I was at JetBlue for uh, 13 years. Uh, I was our first pilot there. This is probably my favorite picture of all time. This is our very first flight from JFK down to Fort Lauderdale. JetBlue flight number one. It's still route number one. If you're a JetBlue fan, JetBlue fans out there, yeah, it would be nice if we flew a little bit to more places than just Boston out of uh, Detroit. So I'm working on that. Give me some time. I'm working on that. Um, my brother Dave there lives in Ann Arbor. Also, uh, we were co-founders together. It was super cool. Uh, it was a great adventure, and uh, we had a lot of fun there. Um, and for the last five years, I've been a professor at the University of Michigan, uh, the business school, Ross School of Business. I teach courses in entrepreneurship, so starting companies up and crisis leadership. And being a military guy and an airline guy, uh, pretty used to seeing uh, crises on a daily basis. And so that's what I'm doing now. Um, on the right side of the screen there is a book that I published in April of this year. It's on crisis leadership. I've got a few in the box over there at the end of today. If you give me, give them, $20, you can have a book on your way out, okay? Supplies, uh, you know, if supplies permit, okay? So give a donation to the museum and you can take a book home. And if you give them 25 bucks, I'll sign it for you. Okay. All right, um, good enough on that. Um, so over my professional career, um, I do have my, uh, my PhD uh, in, uh, in leadership. Uh, which I got from the University of Pennsylvania. So I've been called, or you can feel free to address me if, however you like. Uh, knucklehead works, I'm <laughs> used to that. But Dr. Professor C Captain Commander Mike is what uh, usually works. Uh, Crusher was my call sign in the Navy. There's a long story there that requires a beverage of some sort, so we'll talk about that later on. Um, and I am, uh, I, interestingly enough, in the spirit of you never really know who you're dealing with, I am a, uh, a console gamer, I'm a PlayStation gamer. Uh, I love uh, combat co-op games. Uh, I've got uh, six kids, three boys, three girls. Uh, and all three of my boys are gamers. They're spread out all over the world, and we're gaming together all the time uh, between 4 and 7 a.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. It's the coolest thing. Um, but uh, if you run into Bandit Slayer in Ghost of Tsushima uh, Legends mode, watch out, because he's pretty good. <laughs> awesome. But you're not here to talk about all of that. That's just my background, just so you know who's standing in front of you today. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the Navy Fighter Weapons School. Um, some of these slides have some quotes on them, so I'll just kind of pause on them so you can read through. Most of them are from uh, aces that did uh, pretty well uh, in their air-to-air -air, uh, combat careers. By the way, as I'm going through the presentation tonight, if I show a picture of an airplane that you flew, that you worked on, that you are familiar with, just yell out to me so that I know kind of who's in the crowd, because we're going to go back in time a little bit here. Um, so here is uh, back in the good old days. Uh, back in 1993, same hairline, you know, I don't know if that's good or bad, I was less well-rounded back then, but, um, um, and that was my last, uh, my last flight in a, a Top Gun Hornet, my wingman was kind enough to take that picture of me, so, uh, so that was kind of fun out there on our, on our last mission there. Um, most people know Top Gun from this, yeah. okay, uh, somebody asked how many Kelly McGillis pictures, so here's one, are we keeping track, right, okay, there's one, or at least one, there's not more than that. Um, uh, here is the kind of the one slide version of what Top Gun is, and then I will take you through the history of what it is, but just to get us going. The Navy Fighter Weapons School Top Gun was established on March 3rd, 1969 at NAS Miramar in San Diego, California. It stayed in San Diego until 1996 when we moved up to Fallon, Nevada to become part of the Naval Strike 
and Air Warfare Center. I was the chief instructor when we left San Diego. It was a very sad day. I flew the very last uh, Top Gun F-16 out of San Diego up to Fallon, Nevada. So we had media on both sides of the runway. It was a kind of a pretty nostalgic, sad day with uh, Top Gun, which had been in Miramar for so long. It was all part of the base realignment program that we had done back there. So, uh, so we moved out of uh, San Diego up to Fallon, Nevada. The Top Gun staff is composed of about 25 officers mostly pilots, so it's a fairly small command. Uh, every one of those pilots has uh, at least one area of subject matter expertise that they study all the time. So in addition to being an instructor and a teacher and a pilot, they are learning everything there is to know about their area of expertise. Mine happened to be laser-guided weapons, and then later on in my time at Top Gun, it was the F-18 radar and all of the software that went around, along with the different uh, uh, models of the airplane to deploy the radar. So those are my two areas of expertise. Um, there are also uh, some uh, some airplanes on the flight line, Top Gun, F-16s, F-18s, uh, some Helos, H-60s, and some E-2s. Okay? Uh, NSOC, so this Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center, is the primary authority for the U.S. Navy on air combat in all of those areas. I won't read them for you. Um, I will just uh, kind of highlight the very last bullet there. All of the work that they do is graduate level instruction. So we didn't teach people how to fly. Okay? We taught them how to deploy their equipment the best to the best of their ability. That was our job. Okay? All right, so here is our agenda for this evening. I've already got some smart comments on the number of slides that I have, so bear with me as I power through these things. I, I promise it won't be any more painful than it has been the first 10 minutes that, we're, that we've uh, done our show. So far, okay? You guys can hear me okay in the back? Too fast, too slow? Better stuff? Okay, good. I've got one good supporter back there. Awesome. So, talk about the history of Top Gun, uh, the course. So, what does the training course look like? What do students experience out there? Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about just the evolution of technology, the evolution of the threat, which obviously makes training challenging because the threat is constantly getting better, so we're constantly changing the training to meet the threat. A little bit on the future of air combat, air to air combat, and then we'll come back to some Q&A and, and open the floor up. Sound okay? Good plan? All right, awesome. So, okay, all right, is, is that because when I said if you flew these, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so here's where it all began, right? Back in 1903, Wilbur and Orville, okay, on the first slide, December 17th, right? Look familiar? All right, now I couldn't resist this next slide. So, uh, do I have anyone here from Ohio? Okay, are you doing okay this week? Every 10 years you get a win. Okay, good. I knew you'd have that prepared. So in honor of that, um, I just got to say, for my poor folks from down south, as if it hasn't been bad enough on you, okay, I think you're all familiar with the orientation of the right flyer. Uh, it's pushing. Uh, it's pushing. Uh, it's backwards. Uh, okay, so I launched a license plate here not too long ago with the right flyer backwards, and they very quickly, with lots of feedback from their uh, from their people, uh, they've issued new plates to all those folks. But uh, <laughs> that is not Photoshop, ladies and gentlemen. That uh, that actually happened. It's a highway. Yeah. So there you go. So if you take nothing else away from tonight, you got a good chuckle on behalf of the <laughs> folks from downtown. All right. So. Um, so in 1903, we start to fly. It's not until 1909 where the military starts to get interested in airplanes as a, you know, as a, a, a potential vehicle to, uh, uh, to you know, conduct uh, war, combat operations. And then in 1910, so on November 14, 1910, Eugene Eli, okay, flying this uh, Curtis Pusher, uh, took off from uh, the USS Birmingham here. So uh, the very first person, this is again back November 14th, 1910, to take off from a boat, okay? So first one to do that, okay? It was just a few months later where they put a bunch of boards on top of this ship, the USS Pennsylvania, 
And Eugene, who'd been practicing his takeoffs and then landing on shore, finally worked up enough courage or drank enough of something to, uh, to agree to go out here and uh, with the tail hook hanging from the back of his airplane, conducted the first kind of carrier landing in that same uh, Curtis pusher. Um, and one thing of note here, this isn't supposed to be a history of naval aviation conversation, but I'm always, I always get a chuckle out of the, you know, how they anchored the cables that, uh, that he was going to grab with his tail hook. It's just a bunch of sandbags out there, right? <laughs> so it's rope and sandbags on both sides, and that's what he landed on. Okay? So what this now allowed us to do in the Navy was now we could conduct operations without having to be close enough to an airport on land. Right? We could conduct blue water operations, okay? which is what we talk about it uh, uh, as. All right, it was in uh, the 1st of November, 1911, that this gentleman on the left side of the 2nd Lieutenant Leo Gavadi of the Italian Air Flotilla threw four, four and a half pound grenades from his airplane on enemy troops. So by hand, conducting the first known air strike against an opposing force, 1911. Okay, so just threw grenades, all right? Um, that was a start. Not long after that, it was decided that, hey, it would be even better if we could shoot a gun out of an airplane. And so these two gentlemen were the first people to go up. This is June 7, 1912. Roy Kirkland and uh, Chuck Chandler. And you can't see it super great in the picture. Maybe you can over on the side where it's a little bit darker. But this is a machine gun that he's got mounted kind of between his legs. So he's got a freewheeling machine gun there. Okay. Um, they determined that this could work, but that it was really hard to aim and kind of be accurate with it. So over the next few years, they developed a way to mount the cannon right on the nose of the airplane. What was the big challenge mounting the cannon on the nose of the airplane? Shooting the prop off, which is generally bad. Okay? So in fact, before they mounted the gun up there, uh, rather than moving the gun, they decided they needed to put the gun up front, but they needed to move the engine, right? So they, they spent a lot of time putting the engine to the back of the airplane and actually pushing it. You know, so kind of the jet concept, like the Curtis Pusher. Um, and then they just thought, well, it's, that's heavy, the balance is hard, we really want the, the engine and the prop up front, it's just a better place for it. So all sorts of, of kind of mechanical contraptions to kind of help figure out how to synchronize the shooting with the propeller rotation, it's all pretty cool, okay? On April 1st, 1915, uh, Roland Garris, flying that airplane, uh, uh, achieved the first air-to-air -air kill, shot down a German. German airplane. Okay, so it was 1915. Okay, and from that point forward, this idea of air superiority became a primary strategic objective in every combat zone in the history of combat since that time. All right, so World War I, World War II, okay, today, air supremacy now is the term that we use for having full control over the airspace, right? Okay, so moving forward into the 1950s and 1960s, the, the big brains in Washington decided that the future of combat was more about those three things, speed, power, payload. We need to be able to carry lots of bombs and be able to take those a long way and drop them on things, and that's what's going to win, uh, win us wars. Um, in fact, the F-4, how many of you know the story about uh, the air-to-air -air weaponry on the F-4? What did it not have on it when it came out? Gun. It did not have a gun on it, right? Is that what you're going to say? Excellent. Because it was just determined that we don't need those anymore. Okay? So F-4 came out without a gun on it. Um, so fast forward a little bit to Operation Rolling Thunder. This was the operation that eventually led to the creation of Top Gun, which is why I've kind of told you a little bit of the history here. Um, so 1965-1968, really a, a massive carpet bombing campaign over, uh, over Vietnam. And as that campaign went along, these were the kind of the primary fighter aircraft that we were using, F-105s, drivers, mechanics. Okay, pretty speedy, Thunder Chiefs. Friend of. Okay, friend of, okay, good enough. Um, F-8s, okay, Crusaders, right, okay. Um, and then these guys, yeah, right, fours, good, excellent. All really awesome airplanes uh, opposing these guys. Make 15s, make 17s, and eventually make 21s. 
Okay? And what we discovered about these things is that while all of the artistry from the period suggested that things were going really well, it's interesting that our opponents also had some interesting artistry that said things were going pretty well for them also. Right? And so what we learned from all of that is that um, by December of 1965, so about a year now or nine months into Rolling Thunder, we lost 180 airplanes, which is significantly more than we lost ahead of that time. Now, this isn't all air-to-air -air kills, so I'm not trying to tell a story that it was a bunch of, you know, our airplanes getting shot down by air-to-air, -air, but a lot of them were. They were getting shot down from all sorts of sources, okay? Um, and from this original North Vietnamese uh, Air Force, which was 53 MiG-15s and MiG-17s, even though those airplanes were kind of old uh, and not very capable, they were holding their own against our, our primarily F-8s and 105s until a little bit later on here when the F-4s came along. Um, and in fact, what we started to see uh, about the middle of Rolling Thunder is any time our pilots carrying bombs saw one of these airplanes, they would just jettison their bombs and then you know, defend themselves, effectively you know, kind of accomplishing the mission that the MiGs had, right? Which is just stop these things from, from dropping bombs. All right. Um, in 1966, that's when the MiG-21s came out. Okay, these were really fast. Um, they were hard to see. They were pretty capable, and um, and they were also basing them all in uh, in China, right? And so they were being based in a place where we couldn't go get them. So they just kind of appear. They take shells at us. They run away really quickly. And so ultimately, by the end of Rolling Thunder, we'd lost over a thousand airplanes. Okay, despite the fact that all of our technology was light years ahead of anything that we were seeing on the other side. So, as you would expect the military to do, which it does pretty well, is it commissioned some investigations and some reports. Okay? Turns out that the Air Force and the Navy did two different investigations and reports. Okay? The Air Force report said this. And I'll let you just take a look at that. Basically, it said the problem was we have better systems, we're not, just, we're not using them well enough, so we need better systems, yeah. okay? And we need engineering that helps our pilots know when they should go this way or when they should go that way, okay? So the Air Force went and put a lot of money into kind of systems improvements, okay? Drum roll, please. The Navy report is the alt report. So if you've spent any time looking at the history of Top Gun, or you even remember the very beginning of the Top Gun movie, it says in 1969, the alt report commissioned the establishment of this school. Well, this is the report that generated the recommendations that said, hey, the real problem here isn't that the equipment isn't good enough, it's just that our pilots don't know how to use it to its full capability. We need to train them better. We need to take the experts and let the experts who have been really successful with the current equipment teach these kind of folks that haven't been as, as good, teach them how to do it better. And that, that led to the establishment of the Navy Fighter Weapons School or Top Gun to do that. Okay? Awesome. So in 1969, Top Gun was born. Um, we took an old, an old <laughs> mobile home or a portable trailer that they had at NAS uh, Miramar. They slapped a little, you can see right there, there, Top Gun, right there. Right there. Okay. They slapped a little piece of plywood on the top of it, and voila, the Top Gun school was born. Okay? Um, the school was initially formed using those Crusader pilots uh, who had had the most success as, uh, as fighter pilots uh, during the Rolling Thunder campaign. Uh, they put the command under the F-4 replacement air group out in San Diego. That's just the, the, train, the initial training group out there in uh, Miramar. Um, it got very little funding at first, despite kind of what they say in the Top Gun movie. They suggested that it got a lot of money. It really didn't at first. But as soon as they, the, the powers that be with the purse strings saw how well it was functioning, it started to get lots of money. In fact, by 1970, it was elevated from this kind of startup experimental squadron to what they called an Echelon 2 command. And what that means is that um, the previous two Echelon 2 commands was all Naval Air Forces Atlantic and all Naval Air Forces Pacific. Those were the second Echelon, so Chief of Naval Operations, two Air Forces, Atlantic, Pacific. And then they moved Top Gun to be the third Echelon 2 command. So basically, so I, even when I was running the Top Gun school in 1993, I would fly to Washington 
as a lieutenant and sit next to two three-star admirals <laughs> because my command had carried the same weight uh, in the in the navy, which was kind of cool. Um, I, they told me what to do. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the objective is to do that. That's what the school was designed to do. Okay, we started with uh, as adversaries. So, so different dissimilar air combat training was really the primary objective. The idea was. Um, we felt like pilots that were training against similar types of airplanes or the same type of airplane weren't learning as much as when they had to fight against an airplane that was a different type of airplane, right? Because it looked different, it flew different, it had different characteristics, it had different weapon systems, those kinds of things. So dif dissimilar combat training was the goal. These were the airplanes that we started with. Okay? Um, this, there's two. Um, this was not Top Gun. This was not Top Gun. This was really not Top Gun. Okay? I don't really know what to think about this thing coming out. We were talking about it a little bit earlier. It's been delayed for a while. Um, I will say that the Top Gun movie, and I'm guessing the second one as well, will be great for recruiting. It's great for recruiting. Um, maybe something and it'll be accurate. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but anyway, this was actually the first, uh, the first group of Top Gun instructors. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's not the volleyball playing guys you saw in the meeting. Uh, it's just, uh, it's really talented, you know, regular, salt of the earth uh, kind of folks. Uh, this is the staff today. Okay, which is pretty cool. Okay, these are the adversaries we started with. This is what we fight against today. And that's the 1.3 to 1 thrust to weight uh, beast monster, which is just a riot to fly. This is where we started down in San Diego. This is where we are today. Um, why is it all brown? Because there's nothing there. Okay? <laughs> it is great flying. And the, almost the whole area is a supersonic operating area, which you couldn't do that around San Diego, obviously. So up in Fallon, Nevada, this is Reno, by the way, so we're about 90 miles to the east of Reno, and that whole space is, it is nothing, but it is spectacular to fly around. Quality of life when you're not flying, eh, but uh, the flying, fantastic. Okay? Um, Here's the dissimilar, kind of what we saw early on. We were flying, uh, you know, the dissimilar was using those, uh, those F5s up there. And then, you know, now here is kind of what the dissimilar looks like. And the results that, they, that the school generated back in the day were a lot more victories. Kill ratio went from 2 to 1 up to 12 to 1 as a result, as a direct result, they say, of the school and the training that they improved. And we see the same, you know, sort of, uh, of kind of quality performance uh, even today, which is really cool. So that is kind of the history of what led us to today. It's out in Fallon, Nevada. It's a group of about 25 officers. They are well-funded. Uh, they are training 365 days a year. The instructors out there are flying two to three times a day. Um, so I was on the staff there for three years. I flew almost 900 flights in three years. So that's how much we're flying out there, um, which means we're really busy. It also means we're pretty darn good at the job. Right? You get a lot of experience, a lot of practice. So let me tell you a little bit about the training that goes on at the school. So the Top Gun course does have a lot to, to kind of share with students about what to do, but the reality of kind of the fighter environment is that it's really hard to paint a picture of this is exactly what you're going to see, right? So you have to spend more time, you know, talking to, you know, teaching students kind of how to be a good you know, fighter pilot, and how to teach. A little known kind of maybe secret, maybe not, about the Top Gun School is that it's ultimately a train the trainer school. That's the idea. We're not just teaching pilots how to be really good pilots. That is one outcome. But the more important outcome is these students that graduate are what we call force multipliers, right? So they're basically new instructors that can go back out into their fleet squadrons and teach their squadron mates. So we just don't have enough capacity out of Top Gun to put every pilot through. So we put about 5% of the fleet pilots through the school, and then they go out and disseminate what they learn uh, at the schoolhouse. Okay? Um, so to get to kind of where we need our pilots to be, to get to this place right here, what, uh, what is this imagery, by the way? Okay, this is a heads-up display from what airplane? From that beautiful F-18 that's sitting out there. Well, not that one because it doesn't have a heads-up display in it, but if it did, 
it would look like this. Okay, what's that guy? The enemy. That is the target. That is the enemy. That's a MiG-29. Okay. So what all this is saying? Curious about what all this is saying? Sure. Okay. So this is a pitch ladder. Okay. So this is the nose of the airplane. This is a pitch ladder. So this is 40 degrees nose down, 45 degrees nose down. So he's about 41 degrees nose down. 328 knots. It's about what, 375 kind of regular miles an hour, right? Just to put things into perspective. He's at 9,500 feet, okay? Um, he is at 15.1 degrees angle of attack. He's flying at Mach 0.59. He's pulling 5.5 Gs, okay? He, this symbol says that he has a radar lock on his target. This tells uh, the pilot how much closure he has on the target. So he's, clo he's getting closer to the target at 130 miles an hour, okay, 130 knots. So there's a lot of closure here, which is supposed to tell you, hey, if you keep going, you're either gonna hit them or you're gonna fly past them, and then now you're gonna be in front of them, which is bad. Um, and then he's got the gun selected, okay, which is what gives you that symbology. And then the most important thing right here is the, the radar and the software actually calculates when you should be pulling the trigger. Okay, so that's what's going on right there. And what you can't quite see very well is right in the middle of this circle is the pipper. Okay? What's the pipper? The very center of the, the gun pattern. Okay? That's it for the F 18 up. Okay? Um, all right, so the course. The course started as a four week course. It is now nearly 10 weeks long. Why? Because they keep expanding the mission of the F 18, right? It's a multi mission fighter. So it does air to air, it does air to ground, so it shoots air to air weapons, it drops air to ground weapons, it does close air support, and it does refueling, it does special weapons, so it's a really long course, okay? Um, all the classes now run in kind of this format. Two weeks of ground school, where we teach them about all of our friendly capabilities, including kind of their, their capabilities, their airplanes, our friendly airplanes. We teach them about the threat, so what do we know about the various threat you know, equipment and, uh, and com uh, countries around the world? And then we start to teach them strategies and tactics and how to deploy. Given your capabilities, given the threat's capabilities, here's how we expect you to deploy. We then, so while they're in ground school for two weeks, the instructors are out flying three times a day, getting all boned up for class. So we're, we're pretty much ready to go by the time class starts. Um, we then fly uh, uh, two weeks of one against one missions so the idea is that we use a very, very much a building block approach with the students. So we start out with a very simple one against one. In fact, the very first one against one mission um, between a student and an instructor, the instructor is simulating one of those old MiG-21s that we saw in the picture before, which should be the easiest threat that they should ever face out in the world. We are, as faculty, trained to simulate all of the different threat airplanes that, that our students might encounter out in the operation. So we go through training internally how to be a MiG-21 driver, how to be a, a MiG-29 driver, how to be an SU-27 driver. So we, we know all of the characteristics of those airplanes and we're taught how to simulate them. So we fly them like the best pilots flying those threat airplanes. That's our job. And then our student's job is to learn how to fly their real airplane, right, to the best of its ability to defeat the simulation that we put in front of them. So we teach them for two weeks one against one. We then teach them for two weeks two against X. And what that means is we start out with two against two, then it's two against four, then it's two against six, then it's two against eight. So we teach them how to deal with that. Then we spend two weeks four against X. So it's four of them. So that's, this, that's kind of the most common tactical formation now for any kind of allied force is four friendly airplanes, usually in kind of a wall, right, all next to each other, against whatever you see. So that's the kind of the standard configuration. So we start four against four, and then four against eight, and then four against 12, and all of those threat airplanes are simulating different scenarios, right? It could be North Korea, it could be China, it could be former Soviets, right, those kinds of things, okay? Um, and then we do a, the last week and a half of the course it's more than four student fighters. So maybe it's eight of them, maybe it's 12 of them. There are generally 12 aircraft in the school, right? So 12 airplanes. 
um, against however many we put up against them. And then the graduation flights, so the very last flight at the end of the 10 weeks, <laughs> is all 12 student fighters prepare for a mission. And we join up with the, uh, the Air Force Weapons School, uh, some of the training commands, and we put up to as, uh, as many as 50 opponents out there against them. <laughs> and they mow them down. They're awesome at the end of 10 weeks. Okay, it's super cool. Okay, here's kind of how we set up the, the school. Um, the missions are designed to build on each other. Uh, like I said, the Top Gun faculty provide the bandit simulations. Every single mission that we prepare is winnable if the, if the students are flawless which they are never, <laughs> right? So there's lots of good learning about, uh, hey, when we don't do things exactly the way we should have done them, it, uh, it doesn't pay off well, okay? Uh, and the emphasis is very, is very much on not win, lose, good, bad, right, wrong. It's all about uh, teaching and learning, right? What did we expect? What did we see? What was the difference between the two? What can we learn from that? That was kind of the Top Gun model of teaching. The Hornet does a lot. Carries a lot of stuff, shoots a lot of stuff, and we go through every one of these weapons uh, during the, the ground school and during the flight phase of training, so there is really a lot of material to cover for these guys. We start with the gun. Um, I could spend a lot of time with the weapons, which I'm not going to today, but uh, it is a really cool assortment of weapons that we have. Um, this uh, Vulcan cannon's been around for a long time, and it is absolutely spectacular. Um, I don't know if you looked at the... The, kind of the details down here at the bottom. Um, it fires 6,000 6, rounds a minute. Okay, that's uh, 100 rounds a second. And these are 20 millimeter rounds. And you can carry explosive rounds, depleted uranium rounds. It's pretty cool what you can put in these things. Um, 100 rounds a second. Okay, with a 3,450 feet per second muzzle velocity, which is really fast. Okay, so we teach them how to use the guns. We then teach them all about the missiles that they could carry. Okay. A9X is the current missile, and then AMRAM is the uh, advanced medium range air to air missile. It's, uh, again, we could talk a lot about, uh, about the missiles. Um, both of these missiles are basically launch and leave or launch and forget. So once you lock onto a target, you can shoot, and then you don't have to support the weapons anymore. They'll kind of guide on their own. Pretty cool. Okay. But of course, as, the, as our weapons get better, so does do weapon defenses, right? These are flares, okay? which means that we have to teach pilots not just what to do with their stuff, but how they work. So when they see defenses, they know how to counter the defenses. right? So counter countermeasures is something that we talk about with straight face, because it actually means something. right? A countermeasure is a flare, which could, which could uh, fool an infrared missile. A counter countermeasure is how do we then counter the flare that's countering our weapon. So that's the kind of the depth that we get into. Just for fun, by the way, um, the AIM-9 Mike, which was the most advanced model of the Sidewinder that I flew with, when its seeker saw a target, this is what the seeker saw. It basically saw a big bright spot, right? And so when I would shoot that Sidewinder, it would guide toward the bright spot. When that target put out some flares, like we saw in that last picture, this is what the missile would see, and it was really hard for the missile to decide which one of those was the target that I was on first, right? The AIM-9X, that's this weapon right here, this is what it sees in its seeker. It actually paints a picture of the entire scene that it's looking at. So you put flares out, and it says, that's a flare. Not going there. Pretty cool. Okay? Um, so that our students are ready for the mission. So here's a fully air to ground hornet. There's a fully loaded air to air hornet. Okay, once the students understand all of the weapons, and so you get a sense now of how, how complex this kind of ground school is to learn about all the weapons, we then teach them how to actually deploy their airplanes, starting with all of the kind of the physics of how different airplanes operate and you know, what, were the, what would be the best tactics to defeat it, okay? We talk through kind of what kind of fighting tactics look like, okay? From simple and fairly easy to teach, to more complicated to teach, to even more complicated, okay? With two airplanes, with four airplanes, okay? And here's an example that I teach, uh, I teach a, a, a decision-making course uh, sometimes at, at Michigan, and I use this example because I think it drives the point home pretty well. 
So here is a typical scenario that a group of hornets would be flying uh, in today's kind of littoral warfare mission, right? So we park these carriers 40, 50 miles off a of, you know, bad guy coast somewhere, okay? And to defend the carrier, we'll put up a combat air patrol. So we'll have maybe a couple pairs of, of F-18s that are doing what we call a counter rotating cap. So, you know, there's always a couple of radars pointed toward where the threat might come from. Right? So here's a situation where we're out flying, let's say we're up here at 25,000 feet or so. Okay? For some reason, we detect a threat coming off the coast, which will get all these airplanes pointed toward the threat. Okay? Now let's assume for our math here that we're 40 miles apart. That's a, a pretty standard distance from the coast. Okay? So this will give you a sense of how fast things happen and what these pilots have to work through in this kind of scenario. So here's what's going on, and here's what we focus on at Top Gun School. Okay, once these airplanes start moving, and these start heading toward the carrier, common kind of combat airspeed is about 600 knots. Okay, which means 600 knots from these guys, 600 knots from those guys, which means that we are getting a mile closer together every three seconds. Okay, so in a minute, we go from 40 miles apart to 20 miles apart. And at 20 miles apart, all kinds of things start happening because now we're in weapons envelopes, okay? Now we're too close to run away, right? So di different decisions are happening. So we at the Top Gun School mapped out what has to happen in that one minute. There are about 100 decisions that the flight leader needs to make in that minute, okay? And the decisions around things like this. Where are we? How fast we're going, right? What's our fuel situation? What weapons do we have? What's our employment doctrine? Blah, blah blah you can see. Ultimately, what we always talk about at the school is this notion of winning or losing. Okay? Now, when I teach the critical thinking decision-making at Ross, I use this example to say, if you are a business leader or a military leader, during this hundred, these hundred decisions that you're making, you, can't, you don't have time to worry about the basics. Where should I be in formation? Right? Where should my switches be? What radio frequency should I be on? That's the blocking and tackling stuff that if you don't have that figured out, there is no way you're going to be able to manage the higher level, you know, more complex things. And when I work with business leaders, that's what I say about preparing your staff, your employees, to do the basics. The reason that you make them really good at the basics is so when they run into things that they didn't expect, they, they've got time to process it, right? That's what I think is a really valuable lesson from here that applies in the business world today. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the kind of challenge that, that uh, kind of a pilot today has to deal with and why it, the Topkin course is not just about teaching students what to do. They have to understand how to process all of this. Right? You can't just give them a card and say, do these eight steps and you'll win every time. It doesn't work that way. Right? Well, unfortunately, and we're getting close to kind of the end here, so I hope we're, are we doing okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so unfortunately, the air, this air-to-air -air threat that I just talked about is not the only threat. Okay? Because where we tend to operate in the Navy is not over Ohio. Okay? <laughs> Although, maybe we should. No. Uh, <laughs> we, are, we are deploying to off of somebody else's country. Okay? Um, which means that it doesn't take a lot for them to set up some defenses there. And so here are some older pictures of the surface-to-air threat. And here are some, here are some newer capability. Okay? During Desert Storm, when I was uh, you know, in that uh, war, we saw surface-to-air missiles all the time. Uh, if you've studied or read anything about that war, um, they, you know, our opponents were so overmatched that, uh, that most of the surface-to-air missile shooters couldn't shoot all their weapons fast enough. They're, what they were told was, you must shoot all of your surface-to-air missiles or we'll shoot you or you know, fire you or whatever. So they would run out to their little bunker and they'd hit fire, 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 and then they'd run away and we'd just see a bunch of kind of missiles you know, going ballistically. So we saw <laughs> missiles all over the place, but they weren't targeting anybody. Um, but the capabilities of the threat missiles are getting a lot better, okay? which makes fighting over bad guy country really dangerous. Okay? So we have to make sure our students understand how to do that effectively. Because okay? when you're over somebody else's backyard, it's a, it is really a whole different value proposition. Okay? Uh, these instructors, these student instructors of ours, also learn about the other assets that are available on the carrier, like these EQs, right? radar airplanes. 
they learn about I other non. Those. Go ahead, what? I flew those. Yay! All right. Well, tell us something really cool we don't know about E2s. Tell us something really cool about E2s we don't know. No, the P3. Oh, the P3s. Okay, we're good. Sorry. Guys. There we go. Tell us something really cool about the P3s we don't know. They had a complete kitchen and bedroom in the back, and uh, they were across in the cockpit. The <laughs> <laughs> nice. They stay in the air 20 hours unrefueled. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> Good. Anyway, well, our students learned about not the kitchen so much, but what about it? Could, you know what it could do for them. Uh, we also learned about what our Rotary Wing uh, colleagues could do. We learned about other NATO assets and how they could be helpful. We learned about other carrier ba carrier battle group uh, assets. For those of you that don't know, this is kind of a typical carrier battle group. So when an air uh, when an aircraft carrier is out deployed. It has generally 15 other ships that support it, right? Um, which is the fastest ship in the carrier battle group? Carrier. Darn straight. It is frightening how fast those things can go. And I think Jane says, so this is unclassified, I think Jane says they can go 35 knots plus, which is a little more than 40 miles an hour. Okay? 40 miles an hour, yeah. and that is a, you know, it's a 100,000 ton boat, <laughs> right? And then you throw another, you know, 60,000 tons of air wing on top of it for people, so it's pretty amazing, okay? Um, so after 10 weeks, our students have done all that, learned all that, they go back out to the fleet and they become instructors and do really cool stuff, okay? That's what they do. All right, to wrap it up, and we'll get into the Q&A here, my kind of coming home, you know, um, reality check here is that our threat continues to evolve, right? It continues to invest, it continues to get better, it continues to get more diverse. In fact, I think it was probably easier when there was a big red threat and we knew what it was yep. and they were pretty predictable. We knew how they trained, we knew their equipment. All of that was, uh, you know, was, was relatively easy to deal with. They were bad, I mean, they were, you know, tough, but predictable. Um, now we're seeing our threats come from all over the place. So we're parking carriers not too far off of land. Okay? Littoral warfare is the kind of the new business, so we're parking these airplanes not too far away from really bad places. Mm -hmm. These guys, guys like these, aren't going away. Right. right? We're making them go away one at a time. New ones are popping up. Okay? Making this more like the future of warfare. Okay? Um, we're seeing really cool advances in technology. Okay? This was uh, Eugene Eli with his football helmet on for that first uh, landing on a carrier. Okay? <laughs> Here is the helmet mounting queuing system that's uh, standard order, standard issue for all of the current fighters now. So basically that heads up display that I showed you a, a little bit ago that we talked through all the symbology there, that used to be a fixed piece of glass that was up on the, like right underneath the windshield. Okay? Now it's all projected onto your visor. Okay? And what's really interesting about that is not so much that it's always right in front of your face, but now when you're targeting things, you just have to look at them. You know, before you need to either point your airplane at them or you know, slew some sort of a radar or infrared device over to them. Now you just move your head around and whatever you can see, you can lock onto and target and shoot. So that's pretty cool. All right. Um, Unfortunately, as for every advance that we make, so do the, the other guys. Um, well, just before I left the Navy, uh, the, big, uh, the big monster infrared missile on the street came from Israel. It was called the Python 4, and it was the first infrared missile that could ever track um, 180, basically 360 degrees. So once they locked that missile on, so the, so the scenario that, we, that was most frightening is when you would pass an enemy airplane, <clears throat> they could still lock onto you when you were behind them. Because before that, your heat seeker needed to kind of, the target needed to be in front of you. Now with the helmet mounted cuting system, they actually had a weapon that they could lock behind you or behind them, and it could you know, guide and track, and, and it was a real problem, as you can see from the little picture up there. Okay? Airplanes are getting faster okay? and more capable, vertical takeoff and landing. Mm -hmm but so are the threats, okay? sometimes in ways that are hard to imagine. All right? And while this may be the future of warfare, 
Okay, and UAVs may be safer and cheaper. I do believe that as long as we have troops on the ground, we need trained pilots that can support them. Um, and as long as uh, there are Navy fighter pilots, I hope there is a Top Gun around to train them. <laughs> That's what I've got. I am ready to open the floor. Okay, 112 slides. All right, um, questions? Yes, ma'am. So I'm both Canadian-American, and I've always been really fascinated with the Avro Arrow, and I'm told that it was such a great fighter uh, jet in the 50s, 60s, and it's still around today. It would be very competitive in the world. What are your thoughts on that? Um, my thoughts are I would need to see the, you know, so some of the graphics that I showed up here. I don't know that much about that airplane. Um, I know that there are some small manufacturers around the world that have built some really cool equipment that is extremely capable. I also know that uh, all the equipment that we need today, we need to be able to mass produce, so scale and mass train and all those kind of things. So. I don't know what kind of constraints that airplane might have had. Um, but well, apparently, it came up with some eggs in the 60s, and they had no idea, and it just blew their tail off. Yeah. Like, wow. Pretty fascinating history. Well, I think, we're, I, I think we will continue to see more of these kind of new things appear that we didn't see coming. And in fact, not to go down the, the UFO rabbit hole here, but my sense on a lot of the kind of the unidentified things that we are seeing now is experimental stuff that we just don't know what it is yet. I think that's a much more likely answer than something alien, but you know, whatever. Okay. Sir? Drone pilots. Yeah. Do you think the same training as uh, regular flyers? Um, the mission is different enough that, I mean, they get all of the same kind of airspace, aerodynamic kind of weaponry kind of stuff. Um, you can't dogfight in one of those things. You, you don't, they don't really do too much air-to-air -to -air in those things yet. So, so for the air-to-ground work that they do, um, they get a lot of training in that. Um, I, that's where it's going. I mean, that's where it is, right? That's where it's going. The, the, the being able to put an, un, you know, an unmanned, an unpersoned vehicle up. I'm just thinking about my kids and yours who are yeah. running these uh, gameplay systems. Uh, like who, me? Who <laughs> yeah. So my who so fit all th right into that whole genre of uh, so yeah, all three of my boys uh, and I tried to get my girls they just weren't interested but all three of my boys are licensed uh, drone pilots um, and that whole that training is basically pilot training they have to go through the same you know ground school they need to understand airspace they get a license to be a drone pilot um, because they all saw the. You know, this is where we're going. One of them's in the Space Force out in Colorado now, but they're all doing that. It's the, it's the future of things, and in fact, not just for the military. There's not a big business, Walmart, Target, you know, Amazon, all of them are, drone delivery is happening now. You know, in the next five years, you'll be ordering medications and they'll be dropped off at your, on your porch, you know, by a, you know, by a, a drone. It'll happen, right? Sir. Yeah, so right now, well, so right now the Navy is mostly F-18s, right? It's the mostly big Hornets now. Um, so that's most of the fighters that come through uh, the program. But, you know, there's E-2 crews that are out there. So the radar crews are coming through. There's helicopter crews that come through. But the fighter attack airplanes are primarily the F-18s now. Okay, the 23s will be here, the, you know, the, uh, the, the new, you know, vertical guys will be coming through. I don't think they have yet. Okay, all right, 35, thanks. Sir. Um, you know, you talk a lot about crisis management and decision making. Yeah. The heads up display that you showed, uh -huh. a lot of information there. Yep. How much time does the pilot have to digest that and make a decision? Uh, what an excellent question. Thank you. Um, well, the, so the, the idea is that all of the critical information you need to be lethal is all projected on the heads-up display. Um, but in the Hornet, the big Hornet now, the comm panel is right below the heads-up display, so there is still heads-up display. That is glass and can show you information, right? Communications. There is a glass display on your left, TV screen. There is a glass display in your right TV screen. There is a glass nav display between, down between your legs. There are two other early warning glass displays below you. And when I was at Top Gun, 
and we were working with the, the developers in Washington, what I said was basically what you just said, which is, I fly this airplane three times a day, 300 days a year, and I can't keep track of all of the information that you're making available to me. What are you going to do for the, for the guys and gals that are flying twice a week? Right? They, they, they can't process it all. So, so you're seeing, I think you're seeing us come back to a more simplified, let's try to concentrate the key information in one place. So I think that's what, that's what they're trying to do with the helmet mounted queuing system and say everything critical that you need is here. And if you need extra information, you can go to these different places, but all the critical information is here. Great question. Thank you very much. I was trying to get a sense of the pace of a day at uh, Top Gun. Yeah. How, how long is a, uh, a simulated dogfight, or a, not a, a dogfight, and how many do they do a day, a, a one pilot do a day? Yeah, so this is going to really disappoint you. Um, so the students fly generally once a day. Um, each mission generally involves three to five hours of prep. So they do their kind of study the threat. So each, each flight is a scenario. So they have to learn what is the scenario, what's the political situation, what's the equipment that I'm dealing with, what's the geography that I'm flying over, what's my best game plan against that. So they, they prep for three to five hours. We then brief for an hour. As a group? As a, uh, it, well, depending on how many, uh, as a student group. So if it's one-on-ones, it's, they do it by themselves. If it's two, two, four, and so on. Yeah. We then brief for an hour, and that's where the Top Gun instructors come in and we do the standard safety briefings range, where are we going, how are we going to set up. Then we go fly and the flights last 30 to 40 minutes. <laughs> because most of the time you're at full afterburner and uh, the F-18 uh, burns, let's see, 1,200 pounds of gas a minute in full afterburner and it carries about 11,000 pounds. So if it's 1,200 a minute, you got 11,000, that's not a lot of minutes, right? So, um, so the flight's 30 minutes, and then the students fly back home. The instructors generally do a little bit of, uh, of air to air little dog fighting on their own because we got extra gas, and then we all go home and land. The students spend about an hour getting their story straight together. So they, they what happened, what you see, what I see. And then we send, and then we, and then one instructor will spend the next six hours with the students debriefing the flight. And normally during that 30 minute flight, we'll do two to three engagements. So those engagements last, you know, what, six to eight minutes. All right, so we'll have two to three of those things to debrief. And we will get into every iota of where were you, what did you see? What did you expect to see? What did you do? What did you want to do? What did you not do well? Because that's where all the learning happens in the debrief. So that's a ten. So what I just described is a ten-hour day, and that's what the students will have every day for the for the ten weeks that they're in school. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I'm sir. assuming uh, during these fights, it's all video recorded somehow. And not only is it video recorded, which is cool. So every airplane has a recording system that you see everything. You see what's in the heads-up display. You see what's on all the other displays. You see all of the weapons. You know, so we have all the simulated weapons delivery, right? So if you squeeze the trigger and you, know, you get all the record. We also have all the airplanes that are um, that are tracked via a kind of a satellite system. So when we're debriefing these missions, not only do we have all the inside the airplane recordings, but we actually can put a God's eye view on top of what just happened. So that when the students say, I know I was here and I was this far away and this is when I shot and this is when you should have blown up, we put the God's eye view up and say, well, here's the truth. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, so that the... <laughs> One of the things I always say about uh, what we've learned at Top Gun is the, um, you, if you don't have a plan to start with, it becomes really hard to figure out how well you did, right? So that's kind of one of our lessons. You have to have a plan if you want to learn from what you set out to do. The second kind of universal truth is that um, the longer you wait to debrief, the less you remember. And the third universal truth is that the longer you wait, the more of a hero you were. <laughs> so generally, if you talk to students right after a training mission, they'll say, oh, we were horrible. And if you wait a day, that yeah, wasn't so bad yesterday. If you wait a week, we were awesome. So you have to, you have to get right in there and get into the, get into the weeds and the stuff. Yes, sir? With all the talks we hear recently like the hypersonic missile test, yep. are carriers threatened? Yeah. I mean, parking off an enemy 
Uh, no, um, and it's been a while since I've been in, so I am obviously not read into the defenses that are available to ships these days, but um, my sense is that anything being shot at us that's slower than light speed is not going to be able to defend itself against the defenses that are on carriers. Is that, is that, was that cryptic enough? Can I go over that? Okay. Uh, all the way in the back. That's you. Um, it's, well, it's new. It's very capable. The helmet-mounted queuing system that I showed is in that airplane. Um, I, uh, I am not a, a huge fan of the kind of vertical takeoff and landing just because it's, I mean, it's a lot of extra weight and a lot of extra moving parts to support a specific mission. So it's, it has a specific mission. Um, it won't be as fast as a fixed engine airplane. It won't have the range of a fixed engine airplane. Um, I think for its mission, it's really cool. Um, and I think being able to land on smaller boats or constrained landing spaces is a very important mission. But I tend to be more of a high and fast kind of guy <laughs> myself. Okay. Is, that, is that all right? Weapon, weapons wise, um, they carry a lot. You know, you uh, all of the new airplanes, the you know, the 22 and the 35, with all of the stealthiness that goes into them, that means a lot of the weapons you need to put inside the airplane, which means that that's, again, more complexity and more weight and generally less carriage capability, right? Because you're tucking things up inside. So, it, you know, so for that mission that it was designed to complete, it's probably really good for that mission, but not as capable for other types of missions. Okay, that's what I got. All right, sir. What were some of the biggest flaws in the Top Gun movie? Oh, good lord. <laughs> <laughs> most, of, most of everything um, after the opening title. Wow. <laughs> I, uh, I would say that the, 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 the training stuff they were doing was pretty cool, was fairly accurate. Um, the flying over the top thing was stupid. Um, the buzz in the tower thing was stupid. Um, the, um, you know, the commitment to section integrity and supporting your wingman and all that was all pretty accurate. Um, but How it was just, it was, you play when you yeah, none. <laughs> none. We did actually have a softball game with every class, but uh, no, there no volleyball going on. Um, it, it was a great movie for the Navy. Um, it was obviously great for Tom. So let's see, a year and a half ago, we had our 50th Top Gun reunion. Um, so all, all of the kind of living staff that had been at Top Gun came, went out to San Diego. Um, we uh, rented a big, uh, kind of a, you know, a big uh, hotel ballroom for this big black tie event that we did to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And Tom showed up. <laughs> no, I'm, I kid you not. He, he came he and he, he was, he was <laughs> invited. <laughs> no, come on, it's all, you know, it's, you know, it's, well, he's a it was good. It was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. he was a stranger. Um, he, uh, he came, uh, he wanted to address all of us and say basically this movie started him on his career, um, that he is not sure that he did justice to the mission of the school, um, that he's proud of us and thanked us and it was really cool. So it was a very human moment for someone that we all kind of make fun of a lot. <laughs> all right, a few more questions and then we'll, uh, I don't want anyone to feel like they're stuck here. Let's go, sir. Yes, sir, is the U.S. going to be in a position to maintain air superiority in the next decade or so, given, given China as the new power on the world stage? Um, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, I think that um, I think that we care for our equipment really well. I think that we're very smart about building equipment that that actually can last. You know, that was always a, a thing about the Russian equipment is that boy they built big things that could go really fast and could last about a month. Right? That was their thing. Um, China in particular is great at reverse engineering. Um, they are super smart. They're putting a lot of money into this. Um, I think our training will, I hope the 10 year horizon that you mentioned, I think our training will be far superior for the next 10 years. And I think we need to continue to be smart about how we train people. 
okay, which kind of comes back to the kind of Air Force report versus the alt report for the Navy is I do happen to be a believer that at the end of the day it's about human capability and making sure people have the, the tools and the skills they need to do a great job. Okay. Just, just follow up on that. So, yep. so the Navy's response was Top Gun. Yep. What was the Air Force's? What have they now? Do they borrow a lot of your your ideas? Do they incorporate a similar approach? Uh, at, well, so they have a very they have a weapon school. So the Air Force Weapon School is in Nellis, so it's in Las Vegas. Um, we did the the Navy Weapon School and the Air Force Weapon School did a lot of stuff together. Um, I will say that if you look at so compare what happened to the F-14 over its life, right? So that's the Top Gun jet. You remember the movie? Um, it came online about the same time as the F-15. Okay, the F-14 is now on sticks places. It's not flying anymore. It's gone. And I, well, I just read the other day that the F-15 just got signed up for like a 10-year upgrade program. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they're trying to drag along old airplanes. It's because they've continued to put money into keeping their airplanes current and keeping them, you know, clean and operating well. And we didn't. So. I might argue that you go back to that report and they're actually still doing what they said they were going to do, which is we're going to make really great equipment, we're going to keep it, and we're going to make sure that it's operating at 100%. And the Navy spent a lot of money on training and now we're cycling through airplanes. So maybe there's kind of both sides got something right. Okay, let's go, sir. Um, oh, way back behind No, nope, you're, you're, you're okay. good. No, 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 you next. It's been said that the F-14 put itself out of business because it wouldn't engage in the air-to-ground role that the F-15 assumed early in its career. Is there any proof to that? I think that it was a little bit community-driven and a lot Washington-driven, not putting, not investing in the systems to, to drop bombs. You know, what we learned in Desert Storm is if the kind of B-52s dropping dumb bombs at that volume is effective. But an F-18 dropping stupid bombs, which is what I was dropping, so I dropped 100,000 pounds of bombs during Desert Storm, none of them were precision, right? Uh, now, that's not a necessarily a bad thing because from 45,000 feet, I could drop, you know, a bomb in this room, you know, so with dumb bombs, right? Um, and this is not a very big room. Um, I think we're okay right now. Uh, but, um, but, the F-14 only, the, the only investment they made in the F-14 was the ability to drop dumb bombs, which was too little too late, right? And it would require almost a complete re-engineering of the electronics to do more than that. So I think it was partly the community wanted to be fighters, um, and partly it was just Washington not investing money in it. Okay. The, the left little finger on your throttle on the F-18, what's that, what's on that? Uh, left little finger <laughs> on the on the OTAS. What is the left little finger? Uh, isn't that a com, isn't that a com button? Auto throttle. Uh, I thought the auto throttles were in the middle. I like the auto throttles. I was a big fan. Um, I don't know. Good stepper question. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm sure I used it. It was just it was just there. What about a final question? What do you think about the withdrawal from Afghanistan? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a warrior, not a politician. Um, I think um, I think it's interesting that most of my friends who were there said that we needed to be there taking care of people. Um, I think the way we pulled out was bad. But how could our generals, who are intelligent people, go along with that method? I, I don't understand that. <coughs> I, you know, I think there was a lot more advanced warning than we were kind of led to believe, and then it, it kind of got bunched up at the end. It, it was obviously not executed well. Um, you know, but I, I keep coming back, though, to the, I don't know why we don't give our folks on the ground a bigger voice in these things, because they're out there dealing with the locals and trying to help them out. Um, the press isn't always great, but it's not always accurate. Um, most of my colleagues that were there supporting the folks said these are awesome folks that need help and we're a country that could help them and we were helping them and now we've pulled out and it's just they're going to get slaughtered. Just what you said. A follow up on that? Part of it was because we, well, we committed. I mean we, we said we were going to do it you know and tied up a lot of political capital in that. I, I, again I'm a warrior. I, I'm not trying to 
be political here and say what I agree. We left billions of dollars of equipment over there. Is yeah. it, does it have safeguards? Like, can the no. Taliban actually fly them or in six months will the batteries die and then they can't yeah. fly them or what? I, you know, I, uh, are there safeguards? Some. Um, can they figure out how to get around them? Yeah. Can they support them long enough to use them? Not really. Not. Yeah. So can they hurt somebody with them? Yeah. Can they hurt somebody over a long period of time? <coughs> You know, we saw that in, we gave Iran F-14s way back in the day, right? And they almost, they, they flew them for three months and then couldn't support them anymore because they couldn't maintain them. So, you know, they're, they're very complex systems. They're all computers now. And if you don't know how to take care of them, they're not going to work. Right? Okay. All right. Really, last question. <laughs> What's the situation oh, with Boeing producing military aircraft given all the problems they have with commercial stuff? Um... I don't know, but I would say it's a whole different group of Boeing people than are building the commercial airplanes. Um, I think the, the 737 MAX problems are one of, the, uh, one of the worst corporate failures that I can remember seeing. Um, they, they're, a, they are a total train wreck in their commercial aircraft business, and I think that they they were just too big for their own britches. I think they just felt like they had everything figured out. And, you know, how could we possibly make mistakes? And we're all good. So. There have been some interesting comments about Jack Welch's influence on Boeing. Yeah, we'll, we'll see, but it's uh, but they're they're in kind of an ugly spot. So, hey, it's been a lot of fun. I hope that's worthwhile. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you coming out here. Uh, we have outstanding presentations like this on the first Wednesday of most every month. Uh, however, we will not have a program in January. Typically, we do not have uh, programs in January. February 2nd will be our next program. Uh, Barry Levine, whose name you heard prior to, uh, is going to have a panel discussion with our B-52 restoration crew some of whom actually worked on our B-52 in Thailand during the Vietnam War. Uh, should be rather, uh, rather enlightening and an interesting program. Um, as far as any other programs, events, like I said earlier, just check back on our website, uh, yankeeairmuseum.org, event page, and uh, by mid-January it'll be populated and you'll have more information than you know what to do with. Please remember the donation boxes off to the side here and out in the hallway are hungry. Your support truly does go a long way. Uh, thank you to Megan for having put on these programs for as long as you have. Uh, we're going to see a little scene change here starting next year. And Becca's going to take over. Yay. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Have a great Christmas, Hanukkah, or whatever else you celebrate. And until next time, bye-bye and bye-bye. See you. <laughs>